Aloha and welcome to World of Books, a talk show on books that we think you should read. Today, we're trying to prove to you that a book can be both inspirational, political, and practical. I'm your host, Mihaila Stutz, and my guest today is Heidi Sipkas, the author of Cubicle to Cuba. Heidi has actually authored three books, and she's working on her fourth book right now. She's an adventurer. She's the creator of Look Up Mantra, and she is also a TEDx speaker. Heidi has more than 10 years experience in travel to Cuba, and her insights on the history, the culture, and the politics of the area are very precious to me. Heidi, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you. Uh, better said mahalo or gracias today. De nada. <laughs> <laughs> I'm practicing my Spanish here. Um, well, let's just dive into it. And I'm going to start this conversation trying to um, help our viewers find out how did you become the expert in travel to Cuba? How did it all begin and why Cuba? Press rewind about 20 years, I moved to South Florida and South Florida uh, is kind of the epicenter of where a lot of Cuban Americans have called uh, home. Um, my neighbor was a Cuban American. Uh, there was Cuban food. There was, I, I almost thought I needed a passport to go from my county, from Broward County down to Miami-Dade. It was such a, a different uh, culture. And um, I had traveled since the age of 10, and I was always very curious. And I had even studied abroad in Spain and became bilingual in Spanish and English. And I was confused why there was mixed messages going on in not only stories that I heard about Cuba from uh, neighbors, colleagues, but also in the news. And so I wanted to uncover some of the truth or to experience it myself. So after nearly 10 years of living in South Florida, I took the plunge and experienced Cuba myself. Uh, I have gone to the once forbidden island about a hundred times, whether that's my own personal travel to create the stories for Cubicle to Cuba, whether that's going on the cruises that used to go to Cuba, or being a tour guide for the educational people to people travel that was open uh, basically early in the Obama years. Well, th this is absolutely wonderful. And um, in my effort to create an authentic show, I even arranged for a rooster in the background. I don't know if you've noticed that. So, um, that's actually in Hawaii. It's not in Cuba, but it is what it is. So. Your book has a lot of um, stories about your travels to Cuba, and there are all sorts of challenges, and there are all sorts of solutions uh, to the challenges. But my personal question to you is, did you ever clash with the Cuban police or military, and what was that like? Um. Never personally was I in a clash, but when you are in a country, I guess I would say this about any neighborhood, someone else's home or someone else's country, you should respect um, the laws or mannerisms uh, of that family, neighborhood, country. So uh, in Cuba, with the relations between the United States always being kind of a, on teeter totter, um, I did my best to work with the Cuban government as well as the counterparts on the US side. As a tour leader, that, mean that, that meant that I needed to follow a program of uh, educational activities with my participants that ranged from talking to a Cuban baseball player to doing a Cuban cooking class to having a discussion with a Cuban diplomat about US-Cuba relations. But all of these things were approved not only from the Cuban government side, but also the United States side. And I needed to write up and uh, submit this to the Office of Foreign Asset Control in Washington, D.C. 
Um, however, I did have a couple occasions where the Cuban government stopped our buses when we were in Cuba and they said, we need to fumigate because there's a mosquito issue in this uh, province. So no questions asked. We all vacated the bus, got out, didn't know how long it was going to take. But, you know, uh, when on island time, uh, you've got to throw out your New York minute. Um, I guess another occasion that I maybe had any questioning from the Cuban officials was upon entry to Cuba because they wanted to know what I was doing there, what I was doing with whether it was 20 or 30 individuals, and they wanted to know how much money I was bringing into the country. Very important. Yes. So you are the creator of Look Up Mantra, and I'm going to let you actually explain it in the two sentences. I love uh, that description. And um, I'm sure you had to use it occasionally. Am I right? Yes. Uh, so earlier in my life, I had a traumatic accident that made me reevaluate how we can deal with roadblocks that happen in all of our personal lives. But also when you're traveling, you run into quite a few hurdles. And so uh, look up is a reminder for us all to do two things. And that's be in the moment and find the upside in whatever situation that may be. And when you're traveling with you know, two dozen people in a foreign country, there are going to be quite a few hiccups, whether that's power outages, whether that's uh, no water for the shower, whether that be um, a hurricane coming towards Cuba and we need to get back to Miami the following day. Uh, many things along the way forced us to be in the moment and say, you know what, um, right now we can enjoy our dinner and we'll figure out what the next step is after we finish dinner. That I think we all should do this anytime, not just when traveling and not only just in Cuba, right? Yeah, you can do it here. Um, well, in the Hawaiian Islands, uh, traffic. If you're stuck in Waikiki traffic, or let's face it, Lahaina traffic going back uh, to Kihei uh, or elsewhere, we all could take a moment and say, What's the upside? Well, I get to look in my rear view mirror and see a beautiful sunset, or I'm listening to my favorite radio station. Well, speaking of upside, and I'm going to um, move the discussion into the more serious portion. And um, today it was announced that the State Department will resume uh, processing immigrant visas for Cubans that want to immigrate to U.S. primarily based on um, our, I think it's the type of visa given to family, um, for family reunification. So that's great news. I should mention that uh, the last time such a visa was processed was in 2017. So it feels like this is great news, but the U.S.-Cuban um, relationship has been you know one step forward two steps backward and i wonder how if this affected your traveling to cuba first of all and secondly uh your cuban families uh, cuban friends or families that you know there how do they look at this relationship between uh, us and cuba do they trust it do they doubt it do they want more of it do they want less of it well, U.S.-Cuba relations is kind of like two families that are kind of at odds. The Hatfields and McCoys, or maybe we can go back to the Romeo and Juliet, uh, that they have so many commonalities, but for 60 years, uh, they have been very tense. And uh, many of you may have heard about the embargo that has been in place since Kennedy's years that we have isolated Cuba quite significantly, um, economically speaking. And so it is a testament, I think, to Cuba that they have survived with this embargo for the last 60 years. Um, what we've seen in the recent past, however, is a warming of those relationships with between the two countries. Uh, specifically speaking, under President Obama. 
that was when travel was open. Um, one large economic plus that the Cubans have had with that warming was an increase in remittances. So Western Union and having family members in the state sending money to their families in Cuba, as well as for the first time in about 80 years, a sitting U.S. president actually traveled to Cuba and traveled with his family to Cuba. So showing that um, it was safe to travel, that Cuba was not a terrorist uh, nation as it was on that list until Obama. And it was then later put on with uh, President Trump. Um, one of the things that also happened was commercial flights to Cuba, as well as cruises to Cuba, so that more people from the United States could actually experience uh, the beauty of this culture, um, the, of course, the Rolling Museum with the 1950s American cars that everyone is enamored with, but also this contrast of um, 1900s architecture, Baroque architecture, um, the classic Caribbean colors, also arts, uh, music on every corner. Um, it was a wonderful time that I think uh, my Cuban friends that I call family, as well as anyone who had traveled with me, whether on tours or with the cruises, thought that this was like the heyday. This was the, the watershed moment, that things were going to warm up. Um, at the end of Obama's term, he did something that was quite um, interesting. And he reversed the wet foot, dry foot policy, which meant that if a Cuban came either via the ocean or via land and ended up in the United States, that they could claim asylum and then start the uh, process to become a citizen. And he reversed that. And so, so many people were puzzled about this, but that meant that the United States was treating Cuban immigrants just as they treated anyone else coming from another country. So many people had mixed emotions about this because he thought opening up, but then closing off. But um, the ex exodus from Cuba by uh, the youth um, has been really um, a, not necessarily a problem for Cuba, but sad because it creates isolation of family members in the States or in other countries and not being able to go back to Cuba. Also that the youth are taking their education and using it elsewhere. So it kind of creates a brain drain in, in Cuba. So let's talk post uh, Obama. We get into Trump and somewhat closing back of the doors, uh, limiting travel, limiting remittances to $1,000 a quarter, as well as ending cruises to Cuba, limiting flights to only Havana, so there was kind of the opening of doors and then shutting them closed. And that was economically very stifling for Cuba. Um, it depends on tourism as one of its uh, economic venues. It's not its most fruitful. Uh, it's actually its most fruitful um, export is its own Cuban professionals. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, but they have an excellent medical um, education and system in Cuba, and they actually export doctors, nurses, and other specialists to other countries. And that's one way for generating income or revenue for Cuba. So let's talk to modern day. You mentioned uh, the visa requirement, uh, opening up of family unification visas. Uh, this is tremendous for uh, Cubans. Um, I have to tell you, almost every Cuban family is split, uh, whether it's they have immediate family in the States, some in Cuba, and maybe some abroad that are doctors, nurses, or other professionals that have been export, exported to do a stint abroad. So this family unification is something that is an absolute uh, godsend, uh, a gift, so that people can be with their loved ones. The meaning of family in Cuba is is so much more than just your immediate family. It's a very warm culture where your neighbors, your colleagues are also your family. And I think this is one of the ways they have triumphed uh, over the decades 
by working together. Um, some other pluses that are happening right now, um, as I mentioned, the remittances, uh, Biden is increasing that amount of money that Cuban families can send back to the island, as well as opening travel once again. So um, at the beginning of his presidency, I think Biden had a little bit on, more on his plate to worry about than the Cuban and US, Cuba and US relations. So I think now that we're kind of getting over the hump of the pandemic, uh, we're seeing that more steps are being taken to warm up uh, our, our relationships with Cuba. And for those that may be thinking that, oh my God, all the Cubans are moving to US, I wanted to let them know that this type of visas for family reunification actually takes years to process. So, um, you know, I know some may interpret it quite differently. Um, it, it's a good sign at the same time, it's gonna take years until those uh, Cuban families um, get reunited. I think at, at one point in time, they were saying that for um, a second degree uh, relative, like a brother or sister, there's a waiting list of about six years, no matter where you come from. So it's not happening that fast. Um, but going back to the exodus from Cuba, I was surprised to read on the uh, to read the news that a, a lot of Cubans are crossing the border through the U.S. Uh, or are trying to come to U.S. through the U, uh, U.S. Mexico border. And as a matter of fact, just in August of this year, there have been nineteen thousand encounters between. Cuban immigrants and um, U.S. Uh, border patrol, and those Cubans were sent back to, I guess, Mexico and Cuba. Why do Cubans want to? Why? Why is there such an increase in number of people that want to come to um, to U.S. now from Cuba? I think every country was hit economically from the pandemic, and in particular Cuba with. Uh, a lot of its um, economy depending on foreign tourism, you're seeing that Cuba is almost repeating history. There was a time in the 1990s that Cuba called this decade the special period. So as just a recap of history, 1959 Fidel Castro triumph and the United States pulled out its support of buying sugar. Um, Castro took American owned businesses, properties, and made them Cuban government. So it really was a break in our economic ties. But they needed to find uh, another partner in crime to fill that void. And that happened to be the big brother or you know, the next best thing at that time in the 1960s, that would have been USSR. So they made a partnership with the USSR and basically that the Soviet Union economically floated Cuba for the next, the 60s, 70s, 80s, three decades. So during that time, you'll see Cubans, instead of studying English as their second language, studying Russian, you will see Cuban families naming their first born, second born Conrado or Katia, um, because they were showing their gratitude for this culture uh, that came in and economically took the place of Cuba. But when the USSR collapsed, their economic funding of the country also collapsed and Cuba had nowhere to turn. They decided we're a beautiful island country, let's start tourism. But before tourism could really set foot in the 1990s, they went through a time with rolling blackout, no gas for their cars, food shortages. And it's said that most Cubans that made it through that period, they lost 20 pounds. And many people are saying that the economic crisis that has happened over the pandemic is somewhat similar uh, to the special period. So you're, that's why you're seeing the mass exodus because of primarily economic reasons um, more than anything. 
So um, back to traveling to Cuba. What should a traveler to Cuba or somebody reading about traveling to Cuba um, learn about uh, or learn from this experience? First and foremost, it is such a warm and an inviting culture. Um, people expect, because of our country's political relationships, that uh, Cubans are going to look at us as foes or enemies, but they are so much enamored with American culture. They love us like family members, uh, neighbors. Most have family members in the United States. So it's so contrary. Um, they embrace us. So I want to first debunk that they don't want Americans there. They certainly do. Um, it was shown when Obama came just that this was their moment, that maybe the, the tide was turning. And I certainly hope that that is going to be the near future. Um, one thing Cubans have is being in the moment is the really the way to um, approach life. When the electricity goes out or you don't have milk or eggs or yogurt in the grocery store or X, Y, and Z that could happen along a, a typical Cuban day, they typically have a joke for everything. They kind of laugh it off and they, they celebrate the moment, whether that's enjoying a cup of and coffee. And they Cubanize with, it. They find a way to Cubanize whatever the situation is. And when I say Cubanize, it's kind of in the States how we jerry-rig things, that we find a way to make it work until we can go to Home Depot or until we go to Napa Auto Parts. But Home Depot and Napa Auto Parts don't exist in Cuba. So um, a Cuban solution to a toilet not flushing may be taking out an earring and replacing the chain. Or perhaps underneath that 1950s American classic car, maybe there is a diesel engine that has Hyundai in it instead of the original Chevy or Ford engine, or perhaps they've even fabricated melted down parts to create um, the rolling museum of, of Cuba. Uh, most people say underneath the hood of this classic car is the United Nations because there's parts from all over the world and even individually fabricated. Uh, that's um, amazing. Uh, another thing uh, that you will probably, as an observer of Cuban culture, you'll see that the arts are so appreciated. At a very early age, if a child has an adeptness to be a dancer, a, a, a singer, a musician, they are put into um, art schools. And the appreciation of the arts was very paramount with the Castro's government. And you see this throughout um, every aspect of Cuban culture, whether it's singing while you work, whether it's musicians on corners, um, people that you don't expect to, uh, to sing, dance, or recite poetry coming out of the kitchen of, of your restaurant, and they are beautiful dancers or poetry readers or uh, even guitarists themselves. So uh, the arts are creme de la creme uh, in not only Havana, but across the beautiful country. Well, Heidi, I knew that 30 minutes would not be enough for the show because it's fun to talk to you about Cuba and all, all your experiences. But before we close, I do want to um, quickly ask you, what are you um, planning to, what, what's your fourth book about? Uh, my fourth book is about the Look Up Mantra. So my three previous books were my stories. And when I share my story, people share their inspirational true stories of overcoming obstacles. And so I want to tell the stories of others in a collection of stories from all walks of life. So men, women, adolescents, people from all seven continents of really overcoming challenges and triumphing against odds, whether that's illness, immigration, escaping war, sexuality, careers, and 
you can easily, if you think that this may be up your alley, that you would like me to interview you and you could contribute uh, um, your story, feel free to reach out to me uh, via my website or social media handles. Uh, it is most by far my most challenging um, book, but I think it's going to be my best as well. Well, thank you again for coming today. And to our viewers, you received the call to action, reach out to Heidi. And also, um, I think it's worth to learn more about Cuba and to travel to Cuba and figure out how to Cubanize it. That's pr pretty special. Until next time, ahui ho. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.